Yeah, very excited about this uh, meeting and looking forward to the discussion. And Achlem Masachlan to everybody who also a very large group from Maastricht. So uh, 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 very happy to see you here in Amsterdam. We're all already tired of the whole weekend and all the debates that we've had. But here at the very end, uh, uh, I think this is the last round of meetings indeed that we're going to talk about, uh, about Palestine. In my talk, I would like to focus on the national liberation of Palestine because I think that is the core of the matter. And I will f finish by touching upon how the BDS campaign can uh, help the Palestinian liberation because I do think there's a key role for us here in the West but maybe even more important for uh, the country surrounding uh, Palestine. And of course, I want to start with uh, commemorating uh, uh, Shireen Abu Akla, uh, the journalist who was murdered, I think it was now 10 days ago or so, right? Yeah, a little bit more maybe. And the horrendous way that the IDF thought to you know, harass her, uh, her funeral as well. And I think really this is meant as a moral blow to the, uh, to the Palestinians, uh, to uh, uh, touch their morale, because Israel knew in advance that they were going to get away with it. Uh, and um, you see that all Western um, uh, uh, leaders are saying, yeah, we need some investigation and so on and so forth. And who did you turn to to do this investigation, if it would ever happen, by the way? Then it would be Israel investigating their own you know, war crimes. And I think the eloquent commentator Ali Abunima Abu of Electronic uh, Intifada, he rightfully pointed it out like, this is weird, you know, if, if it, it would be like asking Russia to invest, investigate their own war crimes in Ukraine by Russia itself. So, um, on the other hand, I do feel that Israel needs these kind of moral blows heavily. Uh, they really need to uh, break the Palestinian uh, resistance, because they're still afraid of what happened last year. And I'll come back to that in, uh, in a couple of minutes. Um, also, I want to highlight the uh, moral outrage, by the way, the support by uh, a lot of people across the, the world uh, in, in reaction to the killing of uh, Shireen Abu Akla, because I feel uh, that this uh, outrage is deeper and broader than it was uh, ever before, the solidarity with, uh, with Palestine. So, you know, sometimes BDS is also necessary just to support and keep the morale high of, uh, of the Palestinians themselves. Okay, so um, about uh, last year, I think um, there are some key victories that we really have to celebrate and also highlight. Um, first of all, it's very excellent that the NGOs such as Human Rights Watch and Amnesty finally uh, endorse the idea of uh, Israel being an apartheid state. Um, the second, uh, when Israel was, of course, uh, attacking the neighborhood of Sheikh Jarrah and later on bombing uh, Gaza into pieces, the uh, moral outrage across the world was also already in a very, you know, very broad from, from Chile to, uh, to United States, to Barcelona, to Tokyo, across the world, there was a very strong outcry of solidarity with, uh, with Palestine. It's a very important uh, stepping stone, I think. Um, and the third issue, which I will uh, elaborate on uh, in a bit, is the general strike of May 18th in Palestine itself, which was able to unite uh, all the different groups, uh, the three different groups across Palestine, or I have to say historic Palestine, in, in, this, uh, in this strike. Okay, I'm putting it here forward in some kind of a reverse chronological order, but I really want to stress the, uh, I want to go deeper into this uh, general strike, because I have this impression that a qualitative change is underway amongst the Palestinians. I'm really curious to hear your uh, opinions or experiences maybe even with this. So, yeah, last year, around this day, I think, uh, a couple of weeks uh, ongoing already, um, the harassment of Palestinian citizens in Sheikh Jarrah was already uh, taking place, and the bombing of Gaza followed uh, later on. And in this, in this period of time, uh, Palestinians resisted themselves. Uh, there was this high follow-up committee for Arab citizens of Israel, a long word, that called for the general strike, and normally, uh, this body is, um, uh, consists of uh, elderly people who normally are not really listened to. 
Uh, but this time, when they were calling for the strike, it really was, you know, um, uh, uh, people really followed it up because there was already this spread of people wanting to get in, in motion. So you see, really, in a matter of days, there was a mobilization from below and hundreds of thousands of Palestinians stopped working that day and joined political marches and rallies. So, and this happened from Jaffa, Haifa, Umm al-Fam to Hebron, Jenin, and uh, Ramallah in the, in the West Bank. And I think it's very important to stress this fact that um, where you have this, you know, a strike normally is an eco economic act, right? You stop working and uh, the boss has a, a, a loss. Uh, but here you saw uh, protesters taking up uh, 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 shared demands, political demands, stop the bombing of Gaza, uh, stop the ethnic cleansing of uh, Palestinian families in East Jerusalem, and end the violence against, uh, Palestinian, uh, against Palestinians by Zionist uh, settlers um, in, uh, in Israel. So you had this alignment, contemporary by the way, uh, but there was this kind of fusion of all, there's a lot of groups already active all, uh, for years, of course, and in and, and this moment they really kind of merged and, and uh, put forward their, their demands. And even though it was only one day, I think we really have to look into the processes that are uh, underlying, that are very interesting uh, 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 to, to talk about. I'm going to quote Riyad Alsana. She is a research coordinator of the NGO called Who Profits. She's based in uh, the um, occupied uh, city of Haifa. And she says, quote, we found ourselves in a place where we had to self-organize and discovered that we can actually do it. Local committees developed such as a medical care committee, a mental health care committee. And so there were various forms of local independent and collective committees that were working as part of this uprising. I'm referring again to the uh, 18th of uh, May uh, moment. And Haifa was not the only case where um, uh, things were happening, unquote. Okay, I have another five minutes. <laughs> Then what am I going to do? I'm going to skip this part. Um, I, think, I think we have plenty of time for discussion. You should take a little bit longer, it's fine. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So um, uh, this is one, I had some other examples, but I'm going to skip them. And so there's a uniting uh, of the Palestinians uh, on the ground. And so uh, you can say that self-liberation is uh, on the agenda again. And um, you might have heard about Ilan Pape. It's an Israeli scholar who is very pro-Palestine. And he states uh, in art, an article of one of these ISJs I've got here that the youth are becoming aware of their power. Um, and that, of course, uh, the focus uh, of this uh, power depends on where they're based, whether it's the West Bank, Gaza, or, you know, historic Israel, or what they call 48, Israel, uh, 48 Palestine, sorry. <laughs> um, so uh, you have the, I don't know if my Arabic is good enough, but the Kawa culture, like a uh, very uh, uh, counterculture of, uh, of young people. And you have this feminist group of Tala'at, uh, young uh, 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 women finding their uh, goals. Huh? They want to say that uh, we are also here. So, and Pape also says, Ilan Pape also says that there's a consensus going on amongst Palestinian youth that their leaders are part of a corrupt body. And this is uh, one of the topics I want to uh, develop more, and if I may. Um, so I really want to address this issue of who is leading the Palestinian resistance on the ground, because of course for many it's very clear after 1993 uh, that the Palestinian authorities actually have become the operational extension of the Israeli state. So um, yeah, we need to look at um, organic and hopefully young leaders to uh, connect uh, with the international support that is around and also to understand that they cannot beat the military, uh, uh, the, the military power of Israel itself. Because uh, uh, leaders in the past have done so, and we have to be very honest about these uh, lessons that we, uh, or uh, people in Palestine maybe have to draw. Um, uh, if there's a new cycle of resistance going to open, uh, there are some choices that uh, uh, the leadership in, uh, in Palestine has to, has to do. So to start with the international support, in the 70s, um, when Fatah was becoming a serious force, um, there was a, a w widespread solidarity, especially in the Middle East, of course, with the Palestinians themselves. But then 
uh, Arafat took the line of non-interference, which meant that um, and the Palestinian stru struggle should be conducted strictly on a national basis, and Palestinians li living across the region and uh, the Palestinian diaspora in the Middle East themselves were not supposed to interfere with you know, state affairs in the countries where they were, uh, were living. So this strategy actually meant an isolation when you had an opening up of the solidarity waves across uh, uh, the Middle East. The second issue of uh, 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 being able to confront the Israeli military. Um, the second intifada in 2000 meant a split between Hamas and Fatah. And um, Hamas could position itself as an alternative to Fatah. And throughout the Arab world, by then, you already saw that the political Islam had filled the vacuum that has what has have left after the Cold War uh, with Stalinism uh, ending uh, their... Uh, sphere of influence, of course. Um, so in comparison to the first intifada, in the first intifada you, di you did have these, uh, after decades of, tra uh, of trade union organizing and support at the local level, uh, you had these uh, networks of popular committees, which in the second intifada were kind of uh, lacking. And so a uh, Palestinian resistance in 2000 uh, took more of a militarized uh, form and they had this whole wave of uh, suicide bombings that killed also a hundred uh, hundreds of uh, Israeli uh, civilians and Hamas was one of the uh, proponents of this uh, strategy so they hoped by doing so that they could kind of counter the military or mirror so to say the the uh, the, the uh, military power of Israel and create a kind of um, uh, context for negotiations, but they failed to do so because, you know, Israel is so much more powerful. So all in all, I'm referring to the choices that leadership uh, have, uh, might uh, come across. So let's hope that, you know, the new spokespeople in, uh, in, in uh, Palestine uh, will be uh, doing a, a better job. Um, having said all that, um, I do feel also that the issue of organizing on the ground still needs a more permanent form. And we saw the May 18th strike, what I was talking about, but I think we also need to have some kind of a centralized coordination if, uh, if, uh, if we want to win, eh, the Palestinians, and we also, of course, support them. Uh, one minute left. Okay, I wanted to talk about the South African moment, uh, but I'm going to skip that and try to wrap up. Yeah, so I might turn back to the South African moment, or maybe you can pick up on it uh, uh, in the in the uh, in the discussion. But I really feel that you know the hope for change lies within the uh, the working classes surrounding Palestine, because new f new waves of struggle will come, especially with the Ukraine war going on and the food uh, the production of wheat is uh, uh, very under threat, and people are tends to rise up when the, uh, uh, the chops or the falafel is raised with one or two or three cents, of course. People just can't afford it. So there might be uh, new sparks of, of resistance. And I want to bring back what we saw back in uh, 10, 12 years ago with the Arab revolutions going on. In every strike, in every solidarity action, in every demonstration, you had two signs. You had the sign of Hugo Chavez carried around and you had the Palestinian flag. So people are always aware, and I think that Omar will you know, uh, uh, um, confirm this in, in your own talk, um, uh, people are stand in solidarity with the Palestinian cause, and there, I think, is, lies the solidarity to break you know, the, the border with Gaza and open up, uh, uh, yeah, open, up, um, uh, open up the space. I'll leave it there for the moment then. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, thank you so much. And uh, hopefully some topics that weren't able to be discussed now can be uh, brought up in the, in the discussion some more. Um, I'd like to give you the word. Thank you. It was uh, nice seeing the messages getting more and more passive aggressive as time went on. <laughs> no, I didn't mean... It's just... But, uh, um, yeah, thank you. And it's, um, first of all, I'm very grateful to be able to speak uh, at this really nice event and just well-organized weekend um, about the Palestinian cause. Um, and the, the fact is, this, is, this has touched on many topics so far this weekend, 
but Palestinian liberation is A, on the horizon, and B, at the center of all of these things that have been touched on, uh, whether it's uh, climate justice, whether it's the housing crisis, the minimum wage that hasn't been raised, um, uh, all of these things are sort of connected to the fact that we, as let's say people living in the developed West, continue to allow, um, or can, somehow it, it continues to be allowed that uh, peoples and lands that the West considers and deems as inferior to be exploited, which is also the same way how we got this split in the world of developed and developing. Um, um, and as long as that continues, you know, if, if we continue to allow that to happen to others, it will continue to happen to us as well. Um, that being said, uh, I want to touch upon two things. So I'm from Egypt, as, uh, um, as you mentioned, and um, that's sort of where I first started becoming actively engaged in the Palestinian cause. So a bit about the context there and a bit about in the Netherlands now how the movement has sort of sprung up in the last year um, and, and the way to move forward as well. Um, when I first got actively engaged with the Palestinian uh, cause, it was uh, during protests in 2013 in Egypt against the Egyptian military. Um, and, and back then I wasn't yet aware of the, the intimate connection between that and the, Palest the, the, the Palestinian cause, but um, that is how it started. And the story of Egypt is brief. Uh, I can, I'll try to say it briefly, and it, uh, it correlates with a lot of the stories of the lands surrounding Palestine and Palestine itself. Um, so Egypt, as some may know, was occupied by the British in the late 1800s, and uh, it was your classic colonization, violent, um, repressive, exploitative. And in 1912, there was uh, a, an uprising that was not quelled only by the British forces in Egypt, but also by the Egyptian interior ministry and the Egyptian military. Um, so that was, uh, that's sort of how these colonizers operate with um, you know, involving the state structures of the places they colonize themselves, within this uh, occupation. Um, after that, the British, instead of ruling Egypt, sort of imposed an Egyptian ruler who would be the puppet dictator in Egypt, be it a king, be it a military leader, um, for years to come. And then um, uh, in 1952, the military in Egypt carried out a coup, took over, declared Egypt as independent. Uh, but this military was uh, funded by the US, so we sort of had a switch in who was occupying us. <laughs> Um, and, and this military has been in power since then for 70 years now and counting. Um, and what was happening back in 2011, 2013 is uh, the Arab Spring. That was the time when the so-called Arab Spring was happening uh, in Tunis, in uh, Yemen, in Libya, in Egypt, um, in Sudan as well. And the, this, this, this uprising of the working class people in the countries surrounding Palestine or in that region in general forms one of the biggest threats possible to U.S. imperialism. And um, the U.S. and all the other imperial forces that are active and benefit in this area had to act quickly. And they acted in different areas in different ways, and the results were dismal for the people of those areas, be it in Syria, where hundreds of thousands have died, millions displaced, be it in Egypt, where until now we had one chance to have elections. We elected a, a democratic leader from the people, um, and through the games that were played, the military took over again, the US is in charge again, and we once again have this military occupation of a country which the outside world looks like it's ruled by Egyptians, you know, it's the military ruling the Egyptian people, it looks like it's the Egyptian people's problem. Um, um, but this is, this is the same story in Yemen, in Sudan, in uh, Libya, in all the surrounding areas whereby you occupy the people and you make them live under hor horrific conditions and control their resources and control their land through a puppet regime. Um, and this is, also, this is also directly beneficial to the way Israel operates. So Egypt is, is, is as complicit as any other country in maintaining the occupation of Palestine, in blocking the Rafah crossing uh, and maintaining the siege on Gaza, um, funding Israel, <laughs> blocking Palestinians from entering Egypt. It doesn't operate whether by the values of the Egyptian people or in favor of the Egyptian people or the surroundings. And if we zoom out a bit further, you can also look at South America, you can look at the Philippines, where the same kind of imperialism plays this game of making it look like it's just this country dealing with some shit, but it's been happening for decades, funded by the same imperialist forces. Um, so Egypt is colonized, Egypt is occupied, and whether 
with the whole region living here now, the reason why there's so many people from Syrian backgrounds, Egyptian backgrounds, Palestinian backgrounds, it's painful for all of these people knowing that the land that they call home has the potential to thrive and has the potential to be their home and that they could be back there, you know, enjoying the fruits of the land, enjoying the coffee, not the nine to five lifestyle, having, having this other atmosphere. Um, but instead, we become the immigration crisis, you know, we become the people who need to assimilate, who need to integrate, who need to adopt this new culture um, of the people that ruined our lands. So that's a bit about the, uh, the background. Um, now, in uh, May of last year, when um, international solidarity with Palestine has been you know, around and organized for, for many decades, but May of last year saw a lot more people get involved, a lot more people get active as well, um, people who would usually passively support. And in the Netherlands, that culminated in a number of different student groups sprouting up, um, be it in Maastricht, in The Hague, in Amsterdam, in Rotterdam. Um, and it was great to see. And I think most of us were thinking, we just hope this continues. We hope this is sustainable um, because there is a big role to be played for Palestine solidarity in the West. And the way it's gone since then is, um, um, you know, these student groups have formed and it's activist groups that locally organize, uh, carry out protests, seminars, symposia, uh, screenings, and really work on BDS campaigns, but also on just affecting public opinion and normalizing um, as a student group then in universities, normalizing this Palestine solidarity. Um, and where we stand now is that there is, in the Netherlands, a student coalition of six different student groups working together, working with different bodies um, in order to further the cause. And the reason why it's needed to have this unity with the student groups um, is because when you are in the West, in any way sort of furthering Palestinian uh, liberation, you do face uh, some of the most Zionist structures and Zionist lashback that you would face in the world. So living in the Netherlands, you wouldn't expect the Zionist arm to reach this far, but uh, it is as though you are dealing with the Israeli occupation within the Netherlands, within Germany. Um, and a few examples of that, if we want to run through them, some may have already been uh, brought up before. Um, we saw in Berlin a few days ago, Shirin Abu Akhla was uh, murdered. They wanted to carry out a visual in remembrance of her, of the Nakba, and that was completely banned by the Berlin police, by the German authorities. Um, Germany's a whole other story with their guilt complex, but the, <laughs> the Netherlands is not much better. Um, you, um, um, over the last years, for example, the last year, um, the student groups decided to carry out Israeli Apartheid Week. So a week where we organize events on campus in order to bring attention to Israeli Apartheid. And we'll get to the Apartheid narrative in a bit as well. But um, these different universities were trying to, as a result of Zionist campaigns, um, block this movement, block this, this thing, this Palestinian identity, Palestinian cause being brought up on campus in many different ways. In Leiden, an event was cancelled. In Maastricht, we had to change the whole name of the event. We couldn't have Israeli apartheid in the event. Um, in different cities, uh, hummus workshops were deemed too political. Um, and all these things, uh, for real, yeah. Um, and all these things are like very much here in the Netherlands at our universities over the last year. It's, it's very active. Um, and same when it comes to the freedom of information requests that we handed in calling for all the links between our universities and Israeli institutions. Because that's one of the things that we can do from the West is sort of look at, okay, how, are, how is our own money funding this and how can we at least stop that, you know, at least avoid the complicity. Um, and that was also deemed anti-Semitic. And just briefly, the way when these smear campaigns work, you have anything remotely Palestinian happening anywhere um, and a Zionist individual who is part of one of the larger networks like European Jewish Association, like uh, Sidi in the Netherlands, uh, and a couple of others, finds out about it. And uh, they carry out an interview with one of the Israeli-funded news uh, uh, websites or media outlets of the Netherlands, like Israel News Pintanel. And you have this great story about how Jewish students feel unsafe at this place because this thing is happening. And that keeps pu push, getting pushed forwards until it reaches parliamentary questions, pressure on the institution to uh, block this event or not allow this thing to happen. Um, and eventually these institutions, who are inherently kind of Zionist by nature, buckle under that pressure and impose that. 
Um, but luckily, what's been happening over the last year is, is these Zionist smear campaigns have really been shooting themselves in the foot. With every, every silencing attempt, every attempt to repress an event or cancel something, it just makes it, uh, um, uh, it elevates it. Um, and it's important that this continues, um, and it's important that we also look at Zionism now and anti-Zionism in a different light. Especially, this is a room full of left-wing people, and we uh, left-wing. We have uh, uh, several anti-racism coalitions ongoing in the Netherlands at the moment. And one thing I've noticed is that sometimes non-Zionism is seen as acceptable. So that I know, for example, of certain non-Zionist Jewish activist groups. Um, uh, and that, that, that are included as a voice in the anti-racism movement. And I want to touch upon this concept of non-Zionism as a sort of, you know, a camaraderie uh, pat on the back or a, a, a note, thank you, um, of, of non-Zionism as an absurd concept within anti-racist movements. You, you, you cannot be not anti-Zionist and claim to be anti-racist. And in this, in this case, just like with any other case, complicity, neutrality is complicity. This, this notion of non-Zionism being acceptable, of not having an opinion and not talking about either being acceptable, is not something we, we can allow to exist within the movement, and it will eventually lead to demise if it's allowed to continue in the movement. Um, because, uh, yeah, that's the point on non-Zionism. <laughs> um, and then finally, um, what, what we can do from abroad and, and just the direction in general, uh, I think with, you've, you've mentioned a bit about the military imbalance and the way the Israeli military uh, is in a yeah, imbalanced way uh, more powerful than Palestinian resistance in terms of raw numbers and raw equipment. Um, but looking historically and also uh, logically and at what the Palestinians on the ground uh, strategize, indigenous liberation is not going to come you know, from us carrying out a protest or calling for a boycott here or there abroad. That work is important, but Palestinian liberation will come through armed struggle and it will come through uh, Palestinian resistance in whatever form Palestinians deem necessary on the ground. So we need to, out here, make sure that Palestinian resistance is seen as wholly as Ukrainian resistance or as any other form of resistance until, uh, until Palestinians free themselves. Because we're not there to be the white saviors, we're there to see where we fit in the struggle. Um, and a famous quote when... Uh, uh, the state of Israel, quote unquote, was founded. It was the old will die and the young will forget. Um, and the old live on in the memories and the young will never forget. And the young will need to remember for much longer because it really is reaching a tipping point. Um, and Zionism and colonialism are, are very close to being thrown in the dustbins of history. But what we need to do from here is make sure that we unequivocally, loudly and proudly support whatever Palestinian resistance needs. And that's it. Thank you.